is Gwen Lynn for our Maiden Voyage podcast this week, Green 15, in celebration of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. I'm an environmental scientist, and I'm really happy to talk with Pat Mitchell. Pat Mitchell is the author of the book, Becoming a Dangerous Woman, Embracing Risk to Change the World, as well as the former president of PBS, CNN, and the chair, director, you can correct me, of Skoll Foundation, or the Sundance and the Sundance Institute. Pat, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I wouldn't correct one single thing, except I'm not the chair of the Skull Foundation, uh, but I am a trustee. <laughs> great, right. thank you so much. Sundance. And how are you doing with, with the epidemic of the pandemic? How are you doing with the COVID crisis? Is everybody okay? You staying at home, you staying safe? Everyone in our family um, is doing well. We we did lose, uh, regrettably, a couple of in-laws. Um, so I don't think there's any family that hasn't been touched in some way tragically by this pandemic. But for my husband and I and our children and grandchildren, we're all happily uh, sheltered safely in our homes. We don't get to see each other, except occasionally the grandchildren ride by on their bikes and wave, uh, or they'll stand at the gate and say hello. But uh, but yes, thank you for asking. Um, it's a Good. little bit of concern to me that uh, many people in Atlanta where I am seem to think it's over now that the governor has opened up things and mm -hmm. I don't see as many people when they are taking their walks wearing masks and you know doing the protective things we need to do for ourselves and for other people. Right. I totally understand that. My condolences with what happened with the in law. I just found out I had a great uncle also who succumbed mm -hmm. to it. So I'm hoping we get through this. I, I'm just hoping for the best. As a safety mm -hmm. scientist, you know, I'm really into reading and hearing all about it. You know, but we ha it's in real time. So yes. but a, a science head, it's extremely exciting. But thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for participating. Now, we're, we're going to jump right in this. Um, one of my mentors, king of environmentalists, is Ted Turner, who you worked with. And yes. one of my favorite parts, one of my favorite parts of your book is when you talked about how you went into, you worked with Ted and you went into him to talk to him about the Women's Information Network when. Now, when didn't go over, but when you tried to pitch it, and I have to paraphrase, something about he was really busy, he was running around, and he's like, Pat, if you have something to pitch to me, you have 90 seconds, 90 seconds, which is one of the reasons I named my, my little media and my company in a green minute, because I'm like, ah. if I cannot communicate something in one minute, why bother? So what was it like to work with Ted Turner? Well, it was a lot like that, <laughs> you know, where you you had a very short period of time to convince him that something was a good idea. And if you weren't able to condense your idea into one, two or three sentences, Ted would always say, you haven't thought it through well enough. Because if you had thought it through well enough, you could tell me very quickly. He, he started out at 30 seconds, by the way, and then he at least really? said, okay, I'll give you 90 <laughs> seconds. Um, so working for Ted was uh, a learning adventure every single day. I learned so much from that man. It was also a bit like being on a uh, one of those crazy rides at Disney World, you know, because he, sure. he was creating a new cable channel every day, it felt like. Um, and if you went into him with a big idea, as I did, uh -huh. a big idea to commit to create a 24 hour women's news and information network, which is what when was going to be. Um, all you had to do was convince him in that 90 seconds that no one else was doing it, that it was an important idea for humanity, that it had global implications for creating a safer, more sustainable world. That was it. If your project or your idea convinced him of those things, that it was media with social good and social impact, he would do it. Wow. That's and that, fantastic. I mean, how great was that? I, it was the greatest career experience that I had. And I can't imagine that anybody could have, especially in those days when he was so entrepreneurial and so committed to the environment, Gwen. No one else 
no other media. Pat, he is one of my mentors. I mean, uh, just environmentally and what he was able to do in media. He is truly, truly one of my mentors. And kind of playing off that with that, in your book, and I, I'm going to paraphrase, but it's pretty, pretty correct. You want women to play the female or the race card at every opportunity so we can shift the power dynamic and maybe level out the field. And I understand that. Can you just expand on that a little bit more? I don't, I understand it. I don't know if I agree with it, but I do understand it. Can you just mm -hmm. explain that a little bit more? Sure. When I say play the women's card, what I mean is if you're in a situation, as I often was, when I was the first or the only woman, and I'm sure that's been the case for you, it, and when I would speak, when I would speak up and say, we have a board position opening and I have three women to nominate or I have seven candidates. And I want to make sure that there's a representation of women of color and women on every candidate list. Uh, I, sometimes people would say to me, oh, you're playing that women's card. And if it was a position for which I was advocating for a person of color, I'd often get that. Oh, don't play the race card. Well, my feeling about that is that men who are in power have been playing those cards for a very long time, and they know how to connect those cards into their network of people who pretty much look like them, have the same schooling experience, background. And that's why, you know, on every search list, there are more men named John then there are women or women of color, you know, so sure. um, that's sure. what I mean. I mean, we just have to be uh, assertive, aggressive, speak up and not step back when we are challenged about uh, making inclusiveness a strategy and a priority. Agreed. And the reason why I bring this up is um, I remember reading about, you said a few things about Bella Abzug. And Bella Obzik was a New York politician. She was one of my heroes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And when you talked about Bella, you talked about her as a congresswoman. Um, and then you talked about Deanna Van Buren. But when you talked about Deanna Van Buren, an architect that you worked with, she was an African-American or a woman of color. So for Bella, you didn't make the distinction that she was a white congresswoman. But for Deanna Van Buren, you made the distinction that she was a black woman of color who was an architect. In other words, I don't ever want to be known as black female environmental scientist Gwen Lynn. I want right. to be known as Gwen Lynn environmental scientist. You kind of understand what I'm saying? Completely understand. Um, and I think, you know, and I'm very sensitive to being described as a woman leader when I was running PBS sure. always instead of just as the CEO. At least I used to be, Gwen, but I've kind of I've kind of changed my mind on this because mm -hmm. the reason I pointed out that Deanna is an African-American architect is that she's not a known name in the way Bella Abzug is. So I wanted to make the point that she's a woman of color creating new ways for her community and other communities of color to live together. And that's her work. That's her focus on revitalizing, bringing a different level, way of looking at housing and prisons and schools and everything else. Um, so I felt that was germane to her work, you know, because okay. I, I, I understood. Was, yeah. Understood. Um, okay. In the post Me Too movement, going back to when, when the Women's Information Network, do you think at this point in time that it would work? Oh, the one, oh, yeah. I not only think it would work, I think what you and I are doing right now is an indication that it would work better than ever. Uh, we have the technology that we did not have in sure. 1994 that would make it much easier, much more affordable to actually connect women around the world. And yep. in those days, uh, you could only do it by cable. And that was going to be pretty expensive. So that's why Time Warner, when they bought Turner Broadcasting, shut down the whole thing. They didn't want to spend the money. And they didn't believe, by the way, that women would watch a network that was produced and reported by women. They were absolutely wrong about that. The reason sure. they didn't, we didn't have data on that is because there wasn't much option 
for women. You look at the landscape of news and journalism today, I long for when every day. I long to know what my sisters in the global sisterhood are doing in Rwanda, are doing in Germany, are doing anywhere in the world, because that's what brings me my inspiration. Agreed. And also, I love I love to hear women talk, and so do men, too. It yeah. will give them a, a way into, you know, seeing, seeing what's important to us, our accomplishments, our goals, and trying to work together to help us, you know, accomplish our what it is that we want to do, which in, in theory will help society. Going to TED Women, you were the early uh, supporters or founders of TED Women, the TEDx Talk for Women. And again, it wasn't just for women. Can you tell me just a little bit about the early days of TED Women? Yeah, it, it started as, a, as an idea that the women who were working at TED, and then I wasn't, I was just, a, I attended TED conferences, and I kept saying to them, there are no women's TED Talks there. What's going on here? Surely you could find women scientists. And, and they would say, but, well, no, we actually had a really hard time finding a woman rocket scientist last week or last year. So I said, well, I, I could get you five. I know five. <laughs> and three of them are women of color, by the way. And uh, so they went, oh, well, maybe there's a network of people whose ideas are great that we're not reaching. So that was the idea to do one TED Women in 2010 and put the, put on the stage 70 plus women from every possible walk in life, not a women's conference, but just a TED conference in which two thirds of the speakers were women and one third were men. And that was exactly the same percentage in reverse wow. that was on the TED stage at that time. But it was so successful and around the world, other uh, organizers started doing TEDx women so that we had a global community of, of people putting women's ideas on the stage. And now 10, you, 10 years later, oh, sorry, there are 350 plus talks by, by women on TED.com. They are among the most popular, among the most viewed. And that doesn't mean that the women talks are better than them. And it's just there wasn't an opportunity. This added another opportunity for women to come forward with their ideas. Do you think a Ted Green would work? Well, they're doing one. Ah! Yeah, yeah, this year, uh, Ted and I, I wish they had done it earlier and I was one of the people advocating for them to use the TED platform and the power of TED's convening and, and the community that is global. So they are in November, they're doing a TED climate countdown and it will be, uh, I, I don't, I think it's two or three days of TED. Uh, well, if I reach out to you for information, please let me know. I would I love to try I'm and not, go. I'm not curating that one. I wish I were. Um, but I love sending them suggestions. So send me your suggestions. You got it. Um, just briefly, and I'm going to paraphrase here, your husband, Scott. Hi, Scott. One night he said, you guys were talking, and he said, you're moving faster uphill. And you said, because I want to get to the top as fast as possible. And the harder the harder it is to go up, the faster I go. Are, do you still consider yourself going that fast? I do. I do. I At the end of the book, you may notice I quote that quote about the harder I work, the more I live. And mm -hmm. I, I really do believe that. I, I don't feel 77. I don't know what that's supposed to feel like, but I don't. Um, I feel as engaged, as active, uh, as much of a participant in life as I've ever been. I'm just, I'm finding different ways to participate and be active. And I find most, so many more women my age and in, in that, as I call it, uh, the dangerous side of 50, I, I, find, yes. I find us to be the most active and engaged population on earth. I completely agree. Pat, we are out of time. However, I want to thank you so, so much. Your book, like I said, Becoming a Dangerous Woman, Embracing Risk to Change the World. I absolutely love it. Thank you so much for tuning into Green 15. Thank you. I appreciate this time, Gwen.